Freedom is not free. Discover what it takes. It's time to tap and move forward. Hello, and welcome to episode six of Tap and Move Forward. I'm your host, Lynn Shelley. Today's guest has served his career in the 19th Special Forces Group Airborne. He has served two combat deployments to Afghanistan and has had the opportunity to attend many specialty schools like Airborne, Air Assault, Jumpmaster, and Special Forces Sniper. His awards and decorations include the Bronze Star Medal, Army Commendation Medal, Joint Service Achievement Medal, Army Achievement Medal, and many more. On top of all of that, he is a co-founder of the Veteran Suicide Prevention Fundraiser called Ride to Zero that started in 2015 and has seen around 1,200 participants and raised over $100,000. All money raised goes directly to furthering research in discovering effective methods for combating suicidal ideology in veterans. And now, the interview with Ryan Fleischman. Why did you join the military and how old were you? So <clears throat> when I was a little kid, like as young as I can remember, uh, I always knew that I wanted to join the military. Uh, in fact, I always knew I wanted to be a paratrooper. I can remember being, I don't know, five or six and having like the plastic C-130 with the little green army guys with parachutes and like dropping them out of the back of the plane. Uh, military runs my family. I've got a lot of family members in the military, and I assume that that probably played into it, but I always knew that's what I wanted to do. So when I was 17, I talked my mom into signing for me. She didn't want to, so I actually uh, extorted her a little bit. I told her, if you don't sign for me to go in the National Guard at 17, then when I'm 18, I'm going to go Marine Corps Infantry. <laughs> oh, wow. And I, I, I mean, I had full disclosure, I had no intent of doing that, but it worked. And so she signed for me shortly after my 17th birthday. And been doing it ever since. You've had a couple deployments? Yeah, I've been to Afghanistan twice, uh, once in 2009 for about nine months, and then again in 2012-2013 uh, for about 12. How was that? Uh, they were really good experience, uh, really shitty experiences at the same time. Um, deployments have a way of making you a better person, a better soldier, uh, certainly more proficient in your job. Uh, they have a way of making you grow as an individual in so many ways. Obviously, there are, there are difficult times in every deployment. Um, even just being away from family is hard. But um, overall, they were very positive experiences for me. And it's really funny because uh, as I reminisce, and i uh, talking to a lot of my other friends that are deployed, they uh, resonate with this as well. But when you're there, you know, the first, first couple months are really exciting and new. And then it starts to get old. And you're like, man, I could not wait to get home. And the closer to that go home date, the more you just can't wait to be home. And then for me, it was probably before I even got off post-deployment leave. So two, three weeks, a month maybe. And you miss it. You crave it. You want to go back. Uh, I mean, even now it's been five years since my last deployment. And like, I want to go again. You know, that's, that's who we are. That's why we signed up for a lot of us. Why we signed up to be in the military was uh, to go and do our job. I've often uh, equated it to like a professional sports player. You know, if you practice your whole life and then you never get to play in the big game, you know, it's kind of, kind of that thing that's, Deployment is our big game. Not that deployments are a game. I'm not implying that, but um, it's it's your opportunity to um, exercise all your training and to to find out who you are as a person and as a soldier. What kind of training have you had? So I've actually been super fortunate in my position. Um, I've got a chance to go to a lot of really cool specialty schools. Um, I'm a support guy for a special operations unit, so. Um, I work in logistics supporting uh, Special Forces ODAs. So that's afforded me uh, lots, of, lots of training opportunities, um, Airborne, Air Assault, Pathfinder, Jumpmaster, to name a few, uh, lots of shooting schools, that sort of thing, just to, to make us more proficient in you know, not only the logistics side of the house, but also the, you know, the shoot, move, and communicate side. Um, Why do you think you were selected to go to those schools when it wasn't normally a part of your position? So, uh, I mean, I guess that's a little bit subjective, but uh, I think initially it was because I showed drive and motivation and, and, and desire to go. Uh, and then, you know, after the first couple and 
being successful in those and bringing those skills back to my unit, I think was probably the biggest thing. There's a, a lot of people that go to schools and they do it just for a badge or to say they've gone, but they don't ever do anything with that knowledge. Um, I've made it a point to bring that knowledge back to my organization and, and try to better the organization and become an asset. So I think that that's helped a lot, but uh, you know, some of it's just luck of the draw. <laughs> it's just at the right place at the right time for sure. If you could give any advice to a newly enlisted member, what would it be? So I think the biggest piece of advice I could give is that sometimes the military sucks. It's supposed to suck. It's supposed to be shitty. That's part of the experience. But how you deal with that and your attitude about when it sucks is is what really kind of it's where you make your money. You know, um, those shitty experiences make us enjoy the experiences that don't suck even more. And furthermore, the people that you go through those experiences with, the bond that you forge in, uh, you know, shitty times that those bonds can't be broken. That's stronger than any relationship you can find on the civilian side, you know, usually. Uh, so yeah, it's going to suck, but you can get through it. And because you got through it, you're going to be better for it. What was your best tactic for dealing with sucky situations? Um, so there's, there's a couple approaches that I take. Um, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist, so I'm a, you know, find the positive in everything. You know, there's always a bright side. So if you focus on the positive part of the situation or what's going to come when you finish, um, for me, those always carried me through. The other things that helps a lot is take it a bite at a time. You know, if, if you're looking at a whole poor situation that's, you know, long in duration or whatever, and you've got to battle through it. Um, if you take that just at the next step, you know, I'm only focused on going to the next milestone, you know, whatever it is, and you take it little bit by little bit, uh, it's a lot easier to cope with where if I look at the big picture, that can be overwhelming. And especially, you know, if you're already down, you know, you may not be able to envision success or how to get to through the other side. But if you take a little bit of time, uh, that and focusing on the positives, like I said, have, have worked really well for me. Have you been in a situation where you couldn't see a positive? Um, temporarily, yeah. I've always found a way to, to kind of work through it. Um, I had a, an instance where uh, I got a, the opportunity to go to air assault school with uh, seven other soldiers from my company. And uh, I was the senior guy of those seven. And, you know, air, they say air assault's the hardest 10 days in the Army. Like, whatever. It, it, it could be a challenging school, but it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. It is what it's designed to be. Um, and about halfway through it, I started to get some really severe pain in my right leg. And I didn't know what it was. I uh, went and saw the medics. And they're like, hey, we can give you ibuprofen. You know, <laughs> drink water, face out, whatever. There, there wasn't anything they could do, you know, without dropping me from the core. So I took the ibuprofen and I, I continued on and... Uh, made it to the, the last day of the course. And the last day of the course is, uh, the last thing you do is a 12 mile road march, um, which under normal circumstances wouldn't be extremely difficult. But, uh, like I said, my, my leg was in, I was having some pretty severe pains in my leg. I didn't know what was wrong. Uh, I thought it was like a ACL or something like that. I, I wasn't really sure because it was right at the bottom of my knee. But, uh, anyways, uh, as I was going on this road march, uh, they have pace guys that kind of follow up at the end and, you know, they, yell all sorts of derogatory things at you to get you to move faster. And uh, I thought for sure that I wasn't going to make it, that there was no way I could make it. A few miles in, I was getting towards the, the, the end of the, you know, the pretty much all the rest of the guys going through the course were ahead of me. And it was just me and those pace guys at the back yelling obscenities at me. <laughs> and uh, it was really hard to see anything positive in that. But I just kept thinking about my other soldiers that were there with me and, you know, I couldn't let them see me fail because I was, I was a senior guy. Those guys look up to me and I was supposed to be a mentor to them. Um, so I pushed through, I, I ended up uh, coming in with uh, just under two minutes left in the time. So I, I made it somehow. Uh, when I got back, I found out my leg was actually broken. <laughs> I got x-rays. Yeah, I had a, a fractured tibial plateau, but uh, I didn't realize that until it was over. And if I had known, I, I probably wouldn't have pushed through it, but uh, I didn't know, and so I did. I, I focused on, you know, being there for my soldiers and trying to find the positive in it and just, you know, taking it a little bit at a time. I would just find a, 
uh, you know, a landmark and go to it or get to where I couldn't hear those guys yelling at me anymore. And then I'd slow down or find somebody in front of me and try to my best to catch up to them. Uh, whatever I could do to just take it a bite at a time and, you know, focus on the outcome and made it through. So that's, that's one example of it. it took me a while. I, I almost, I almost quit. I almost gave up, but I didn't. Was that the most difficult school that you've been to? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I, I suppose that de- depends on how you define difficult, but uh, no, I, I wouldn't necessarily say so. It, it was because of that, I guess. Um, that injury certainly made it <laughs> a lot more challenging than it otherwise would have been. But What would you say your most challenging school was? Um, in, in lots of different ways. I, I can think of two schools that were, were very challenging for me in, in separate ways. Uh, the, one of them was, was Pathfinder. Um, which uh, is very academically intense. There's almost nothing physical about the course, um, but it's a very academically challenging course. There's a a lot of math, a whole bunch of memorization. You have very short time to to learn stuff. And then in other ways, uh, I had the opportunity uh, several years ago now uh, to go to the Special Forces Sniper course, uh, which was, again, it's a really unique position as as a support guy that doesn't happen very often. Um, but I was, uh, at the time I was serving as a armor for our, our group. And so I used that as kind of a justification and I was able to get in and, and that was challenging in a lot of ways, mostly because a lot of the people there didn't feel like I should have been there. Uh, cause I was a support guy. I wasn't an operator. Why do I need to be a sniper? Right. Which has some validity for sure. Um, and so, so that tested a lot of, a lot of different things. You know, the course as it is designed is designed to be challenging too, but, um, knowing that there was not everybody. There were certainly people there that wanted to see me succeed, but there was also people there that, there that wanted me not to succeed uh, just because of my status in the organization. Uh, so that had its challenging aspects as well. Have you seen failure in your career, what you would consider failure, and how did you deal with that? Um, yeah, that's a tough one for me, honestly. Uh, because of those those things that we talked about when, when things get tough, you know, of finding the you know the bright side of things and uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to not experience a lot of failure in my career personally, but one thing I've noticed uh, seeing it through, you know, those around me and those I've worked with and uh, is people have a tendency to get in a, a failure trap. You know, they, they get in a mind trap of only being able to see the shortcomings and not focusing on how getting that far made them a better person or how, you know, they can improve and, and get it again next time or, or, or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, trying to avoid those thinking traps and just staying positive, I think is the best way to overcome failure. You said that when you went to these schools, you were able to come back and apply it inside of your your unit. Did you find unconventional ways of doing that? If it wasn't a normal part of your job, or did you find ways to support in doing the things that you learned? Uh, so a little bit of both. So um, some of those schools, you know, are, they're not as uncommon in, you know, as for support guys, you know, like the, the, the jump master and the aerosol and the pathfinder, like there are guys that, that get those schools, but you know, the opportunity that I've had to go to all those schools is, is I guess what's more uh, unique. Uh, but, but the biggest thing that, that I've tried to do as far as bringing that knowledge back to the organization is by conducting training events that incorporate those skills. Um, and getting guys hands-on and the opportunity to learn them. Uh, the other thing I've tried really hard to do is if there's other guys going to those schools, I've tried to prep them to give them the best chance of success. Um, but especially, you know, in, in an airborne unit, that's we're very proud of that fact. It's it, There's a lot of heritage and history in the, in the airborne community. Um, and so taking that knowledge and making it institutional knowledge and not just keeping it to ourselves, you know, that's that's something that I've really tried to do. You know, I've really tried to um, mentor junior jumpers and, you know, proper procedures and canopy control and that sort of thing. And I've tried to mentor other jump masters on how to, how best ways that I've found to, to do the job and and that sort of thing. But at at the end of the day, it just comes down to, to teaching soldiers, you know, imparting your knowledge as, as a leader, like we have to be able to impart our knowledge and, and teach our soldiers. If we can't do that, then what good are we? Do you find that there's particular character traits that help with that, aside from just the skill set that it requires? 
Yeah, I think confidence is the biggest thing. And <laughs> and that's uh that's a a trait that I feel has carried me through most of my life to some extent. Um you know, you can you can lack a lot, but if you have confidence in situations, you can get it done. Um and I think especially, you know, when you're instructing others, uh, confidence in your your course topic and uh you know, being able to project that confidence and that knowledge on on those you're instructing uh makes the lesson stick a lot more, I think. Who's been most influential to you during your career? So I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a little bit of background story as I, as I uh, go into to this to, to kind of set it up a little bit. But in 2014, I was notified that I was getting moved to a different position. I was going to become a, a training NCO for a special forces forward support company. Um, so, uh, in the national guard side, we have, uh, what I am as an AGR active guard reserves. That means it's my full-time job to be in the national guard. So, uh, there's about 10% of the unit or so that has that, that, uh, those orders. Uh, so anyway, so I was getting transferred to, to be this training NCO in this newish company. The company had only been around for about a year at this point. Uh, but the guy that was running this company, uh, was a gentleman by the name of John Oldroyd, John Wayne Oldroyd, actually, everybody calls him John Wayne. That's actually his middle name is Wayne. Um, and to this point, I had only heard bad things about him. I heard he was a hard ass. I heard, you know, it was like being in basic training and, uh, you know, he was really, uh, instilled a lot of discipline in his troops, but to the point where it was almost excessive and coming from a, a special operations unit, it's, there's a lot of, uh, non-conventional stuff that happens and a lot of things we do are non-conventional. So that sort of thing is often frowned upon, you know, which I, I don't necessarily think is fair, but that's the culture of the unit. Um, so, and then there had been instances where I, him and I had have brief interactions, uh, and they, they weren't positive. So when I found out I was going to this unit, uh, I tried to fight it actually. I was like, I went to talk to my sergeant major. I'm like, Hey, like I'm in the army. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But so that, you know, I, I don't want to do this. I don't feel comfortable working for him, whatever. Uh, cause I was young and dumb and didn't, you know, take lessons as they were given to me, I guess. So, uh, anyway, so I ended up working at this company, um, and over the course of all the years since then, um, not only have I grown to be able to tolerate John Wayne, John Wayne, but he's actually one of my closest friends and uh, mentors, and he's taught me so much about being a leader and being a man and being a jump master and like everything that I attribute a lot of my where I'm at now to to him and his teachings and him mentoring me, and the the things that we were able to achieve in that company together were were amazing. I mean, we, we made that company solid and it was because of his mentorship. So easily the person that's had the most influence on me over my career is John Wayne. Do you remember what happened where things shifted for you? As far as between him and I? Right. I was really early on. <laughs> it didn't take long of working, you know, directly for him and directly together, you know, as as AGRs, there was only three of us that worked full time in the unit and two of us in that building. So, you know, we worked, we interfaced all day, every day. Um, and it was um, not long after that that we started riding motorcycles together and became very close friends. And, and like I said, to, to this day, he's, he's one of my closest brothers. Are there any books that have been influential to you in your life and your career? Um, so early on, especially in my teens, I, I love to read. I was, I was an avid reader. Um, and there was a lot of military books that I, that I read. Uh, I, I couldn't name any specifically for you, but, uh, and, and they helped solidify my decision, you know, to, to go into the airborne and to be a paratrooper. Most of them are based off of that. I remember, um, reading Band of Brothers, uh, shortly after the movie came. Actually, I might've read it before the movie. I don't recall, but, you know, and that was, that was just, uh, reinforcing that, that tradition and, uh, that culture of the airborne that I wanted to be a part of. What behavior or skill have you learned inside of the military that has most impacted your life? So that's a tough one. You can name more than one. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of skills that I've, that I've come away from the military with, um, leadership is one, you know, they, they say that, uh, great leaders are born, not made. And, and I don't necessarily agree with that. I think there are personality traits that can make somebody a better leader. You know, confidence is one that I talked about. But I think there's always room for improvement. And, and I, so I think that my leadership has drastically improved since I've been in the military. I think I've got a long way to go still. Um, but, but that's certainly one. Um, the military has absolutely uh, boosted, my, boosted my confidence. 
Um, so that's one as well. Um, compartmentalization is an interesting one. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I won't go into too many stories there, but um, having the ability to um, separate and compartmentalize different parts of your life and different experiences um, to where you can access them on demand, but where they don't, they're not always there is a, is a skill that I've developed since being in the military. I think I probably had a little bit of it growing up as well, but I've certainly perfected that as part of the military. Um, and that's, that's a good and a bad thing. Um, there are certainly times where compartmentalization is appropriate and has absolutely positively affected my life. And there's been times where, uh, it's negatively done so, but, Can but you yeah, give an example? Uh, I'd rather not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any other skills? Um, I mean, I think just the never quit attitude that we often get in the military, you know, that's something that's not as common, uh, in the civilian sector, uh, that, that again, I probably had a little bit of that instilled in me growing up for sure, but uh, I've certainly, uh, added to that since being in the military. You told me before that you got pulled into doing some more things on your deployment than what you were normally just there for. How did that happen? Yeah. So, and that, that's actually happened on, on both my deployments. Uh, like I said, I'm a, a logistician by trade, uh, that supports special operations units. So, uh, my job typically doesn't require me to go outside of the wire or go out on combat missions. Um, on my first deployment, I was, a uh, small arms repairman for a special operations task force. So I was in charge of uh, repairing all the weapons that came in from the ODAs and different things. And um, through that knowledge of firearms and weapon systems and stuff, uh, I was scooped up to be a part of a forward logistics element tactical, which basically was a, a convoy team. We did uh, convoy security for resupply convoys. Um, so I was able to do that all through my, my first deployment. I went out on lots and lots of you know resupply convoy security missions. Uh, again, I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't, I didn't go there to do that. It was just a, you seem like, you know what you're doing, come with us kind of a thing. And in the one thing I've learned working in, working with special forces is that everything, a lot of things are, are personality and skill based. If you're competent and people get along with you, uh, you can get a lot of opportunities. So on my second deployment, uh, again, working logistics, I was, uh, in charge of uh, all logistics for our, our aerial delivery. So all of our airdrop resupplies that went out through the through Afghanistan um, had about $44 million worth of stuff that I was in charge of getting for the riggers and that sort of thing. Every Sunday they ran a range and uh, I love to shoot. So I started going to these ranges and made friends with uh, one of the special forces teams there that was doing security missions for the general. And uh, after a while, after talking to them, working with them and shooting with those guys, they're like, hey, why don't you start coming out with us? And so I did, I got the opportunity to do a whole bunch of, uh, security missions for the general and other VIPs, uh, throughout the country, which was a pretty cool experience. And like I said, wasn't, wasn't what I went to Afghanistan to do. Wasn't necessarily what I was supposed to do, but right place, right time, right attitude, I guess. I don't think it's just the right place, right time. <laughs> I think it's utilizing your skills, your confidence showing up and it sticks out when you're, when you're really on top of your game like that. So it makes it easy for them when they're looking for people or even if they're not looking for people. <laughs> yeah, I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they were looking when they found me, but, but that's all right. I, I built a lot of good friendships based off of that and had a lot of really good experiences. That's really cool. What do you consider your greatest military accomplishment and why? So this one, I, I, I'm going to go off course a little bit on this. So uh, it's not specifically a military achievement, but it's an achievement that I've accomplished while being in the military. Um, so I mentioned that when I was working with John Wayne, we started riding motorcycles together. So motorcycles are something him and I are both very passionate about. We, we love our motorcycles. Um, in 2015, I think, I believe it was January of 2015. Um, we started talking about how we needed to use our motorcycles to do something better for, or to do something for veterans causes. Uh, we wanted to help other veterans and, and do whatever we could to make that happen. And we were talking about different areas where veterans need help. And one of the topics that came up was uh, suicide prevention. So we had, we had all but decided that that's where our focus needed to be because there's a, a you know, huge epidemic of veterans taking their own lives. And shortly after that, I was notified that my section sergeant from my first deployment to Afghanistan, uh, who was on that 
one of the guys that got me on that convoy team had taken his own life. Uh, so that was pretty much all the motivation I needed to, to do something about it. So John Wayne started to do a lot of research, trying to find the right organization to give money, any money we raised to. Because, uh, you know, there's, especially in the, the veteran community, there's several organizations, you know, uh, that charitable organizations that sm only small portions of their funds actually go to help veterans. Uh, and at the time, there was several scandals involving, you know, really big name charitable organizations. And so we wanted to make sure we stayed away from that. So John Wayne did a bunch of research. And what he found was at the University of Utah, there is an organization called the National Center for Veteran Studies, headed by Dr. Craig Bryan. And their focus is PTSD treatment and uh, preventing suicidal, suicidal ideology in veterans. So we're like, well, this is cool. It's right here in our backyard. We started doing a little bit of research and uh, everything that we're finding was, was very positive. And so we set up a meeting with Dr. Brian and his wife, Annabelle. And within 10 minutes of talking to these guys, we knew 100% that this was the organization that we wanted to support. So Dr. Brian and his wife and most of his staff are combat veterans. Um, so they understand what combat veterans go through because they've been there themselves. And they're work in treating and even curing PTSD is phenomenal. Um, their, their methods are, are unmatched anywhere else. You know, Dr. Brian spearheaded a lot of research that's being integrated worldwide. There's foreign militaries that come to him and asking for his systems. Uh, so once we knew that that was the organization we wanted to do, or we wanted to give our money to, then came the hard part, raising money. <laughs> and at the time, um, our first meeting, I'll never forget our first meeting with Dr. Brian and Annabelle. You know, we were kind of trying to manage expectations. And uh, we're like, yeah, we could we could probably get about 50 bikes to show up and maybe raise a couple thousand dollars. So we, we set forth to do good things. And uh, we created an organization called Ride to Zero. It's a motorcycle ride that's obviously focused on veteran suicide prevention. So we ran our first year and uh, had a lot of success, had about... 300 bikes show up and raise just under 20 grand. Wow. Um, and that's continued every year since then. Uh, to date, we've had almost 1,200 participants and raised over $100,000. Uh, so all of that money's gone directly to, to Dr. Brian and his crew. Um, they've done a lot of good things with it. It's uh, funded significant research that they've uh, implemented into their treatment programs. It's funded treatment for several veterans that, that couldn't fund it on their own. And it's done a lot of really good things. So that's where where we've come and what we've done with Ride to Zero and how much money we've raised for Dr. Brian's good work is by far my proudest achievement that wow. I've had in the military. That is amazing. Have you have you seen the movie Thank You for Your Service? I've not. Have you heard about it? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, it's cuz it's really mostly about coming home and dealing with those pressures instead of the wartime scenario. It includes a little bit of the wartime mm. scenario just so that you understand a little bit of what their struggle is. But it was it was intense. It was surprisingly intense dealing with... But I, I appreciated seeing a, a movie that's bringing a little more awareness to the difficulty in that, that time of coming home. It, it's definitely not an easy thing. And um, everybody handles it differently and everybody's experiences overseas are different. Um, but the one thing that everybody has is an adjustment period. Right. And, you know, whether that means you have six months of road rage or whether that means you struggle with suicidal ideology, like everybody is affected in some way. If you could give a superpower to the new enlistees, what would you give them? Resilience. Resilience. What do you mean by that? So it, it's, it's really interesting to me, uh, and I don't know how about the other branches, but the army has uh, put a lot of time and money and effort into resilience training. And when I first heard about this, I, I honestly, like, I'll be, I thought it was a joke. Like, I, I'm like, well, why do we need to build resilience? Like, we're soldiers. Can't we just be resilient, you know? Um, and the more I started to analyze, like, as I sat through these trainings, because it's mandatory training, I'm looking at these concepts and I realize this is just stuff that I just have naturally. Like, how do people not have this? And then as I dug into it deeper and as I self-evaluated more, I realized it's not, these aren't 
traits or skills that I've had my whole life. These are skills and traits that I've developed throughout my life because of adversity. And at least my theory on it, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not a professional by any means, but uh, my theory on it is that adversity breeds resilience. And the more adversity you face throughout your life, the more different ways you find to cope with that, and the more resilient you are. Uh, one of the problems that we're running into with our younger generation of soldiers and airmen and sailors and Marines coming in is that they've not faced enough adversity in their lives to be able to cope with it and be resilient. And I mean, there are countless factors on why that could be, and, and I'm not going to take a stab at why I think it is, but the fact of the matter is that that's accurate. Our, our new troops coming in aren't as resilient as previous generations. Um, and I factor it to be because they've not faced enough adversity in their life for whatever reason. So, so yeah, that's, that's probably a superpower I'd give if you call it a superpower is, is resilience. Because if you're truly resilient, you can get through anything. And that's something that I see lacking in new troops coming in. What do you think is your best ability with resilience? Uh, it goes back to just that positive outlook, like always finding the, you know, always finding the, the silver lining. Because there always is something. You know, even if it's just, I learned not to do this again, or, I, you know, I, I, I made it through it on the tail end. Like, there's always going to be something positive about every given experience. And sometimes it's hard to find. It really can be hard to find sometimes. But if you can find that and if you can hold on to it, it's at least gotten through me through a lot. I've noticed for myself that you can't just think of what's positive. You have to feel it or believe it you can't just try and force it on yourself <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that you know they, they talk about uh you know the the law of attraction or whatever and putting it out into the universe and as much of it uh, as some people think that's a joke like that's something that i practice in my life is <laughs> as simple as parking spaces you know like <laughs> Do I believe I believe there's going to be a parking space on the front and there's a parking space at the front like it just happens it you know works for you? I wouldn't say always but more than not you know and and it's I mean that's just a silly example but uh, you can apply that to anything you know if you're absolutely right you can't just try to focus on it like you have to believe that whatever that positive thing is that you're holding on to is is real and true and it's probably going to work out for you How do you respond when people say to you thank you for your service so my go-to response, my canned answer is thank you for your support. Um, That's mine too. Li li like most service members, I, I hate that question. Um, I understand that, like as much as uncomfortable as it makes us, I understand that it makes that person feel better. It makes them feel like, you know, most of the time, you know, sometimes like people are super genuine, but most of the time it's somewhat obligatory and it makes them feel like they support the troops and they're doing something good, which is awesome. Like, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of Vietnam vets and I've ridden with a lot of Vietnam vets and they didn't have that. They didn't have the support of their, right. uh, their, their community when they came back home. Right. And so even as awkward as a position as that puts me in, like, I'm still grateful that their heart's at least in the right place. Like, even if their execution makes it a little awkward for us, like, whatever, it, that's a lot more than previous generations had. And so I'm, I'm thankful for it. Um, another answer that I've heard a lot of people say is, you know, it's my pleasure. Uh, just simple. You don't have to say anything more than that. But thank you for your support. It's my pleasure. Well, Ryan, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I thank really you. appreciate you being on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found a new mindset to help you excel. I loved that the mindsets Ryan talks about also describe what the phrase embrace the suck really means. Finding the positive forming strong bonds, having the right attitude, understanding that it's supposed to be shitty. And as he said, adversity breeds resilience. And if you're truly resilient, you can get through anything. Please join me and share your favorite concepts from this episode on the Tap and Move Forward website or social media sites. If you want information on Ride to Zero or to read more about Ryan, please visit www.tamfpodcast.com forward slash never quit.